Excuse me, you love. Hi, guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous. We are talking about an over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of everything here on this spectacularly gorgeous. It is a Saturday afternoon. February 24th, 2024, and uh, <clears throat> I actually have to go join a couple of Trump Tard friends of mine. We have a gig, I have a gig here uh, to play acoustic music with my Trump Tard friends while I still can. Uh, but before I head out, just want to, uh, I, I want to see who I can piss off. And we're going to beat a dead horse uh, here for the next few minutes. Uh, and don't worry, we're not talking about the dead horse of Corona Panic. We're not gonna, not gonna beat that dead horse. Ugh. We're going to beat the dead horse of uh, the myth of the noble savage. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just can't shut up about it. I, you know, I used to suffer from the myth of the noble savage as much as any limp dick lefty snowflake on the planet before uh, I pulled my head out of my ass. It was in uh, 2009 uh, when I actually spent some time with some noble savages in the Peruvian Amazon along the banks of the Mother of God River and forever disabused my limp dick lefty snowflake self of the uh, just of this pernicious myth that there's some group of humans some group of humans on this planet that are like like on some pedestal that makes them superior to the rest of humans. Well, I, once I got up close and personal with some of these very nice noble savages, uh, I, I no longer suffer the myth. I understand that humans are humans, always have been humans, always will be humans. And uh, so uh, I, I want to congratulate some fellow never heard of in my life, Ronan Cray. Ronan Cray, I think uh, he is from New Zealand. He is a Kiwi. So we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about, how do you pronounce it, the Maori? I used to say Maori but I think I was corrected that it's Maori or the local noble savages down there in New Zealand that this, uh, I guess he is a honky, uh, is going to tell us about. But before we dive in, I just need to, uh, to just e e even Ronan uh, is still using the word indigenous, indigenous, to describe any human not from equatorial Africa, okay? If you are not uh, from uh, living in equatorial Africa listening to this rant, you are not an indigenous human. New Zealand has uh, no more has indigenous humans than Australia has indigenous humans than uh, certainly here in Turtle Island, North America, South America. There are no indigenous humans in the Amazon. There are no indigenous humans anywhere except in equatorial Africa. So even this man does not understand the definition of indigenous. If humans had just stayed where the hell we were, we originally came from, this planet would not look like it does. But with that uh, disclaimer out of the way, 
we're going to dive into the single best, this is the single best essay I have ever read in my entire life, taking down the myth of the noble savage titled Future Eaters. The UN is wrong about indigenous people. Yes, Tim Flannery's book, Future Eaters, which I read years ago and need to reread. An excellent book for anybody suffering the myth of the noble savage. Tim Flannery's The Future Eaters, uh, pretty much anything by Jared Diamond, particularly uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Ronald Wright's Short History of Progress, the book 1491, can't remember who wrote that, uh, but anyway, we're going to sum up, uh, I guess, mostly the future eaters. Tim Flannerty's book shows we will not solve climate change by following the paths of our ancestors. And we start off with the um, staying from the United Nations indigenous, and I would put the word, that little sick, S-I-C, indigenous peoples have the knowledge and practices needed for the global community to implement and scale up climate action. That was from How Indigenous Peoples Enrich Climate Action from the UN. So begins the United Nations stance on climate change. You hear this unadulterated horseshit, well, those were my two words, you hear this often from well-meaning people and clueless morons, particularly uh, limp dick lefty snowflakes, but not always. You hear this often from well-meaning people concerned about our industrialized society's impact on the climate. climate. They look to indigenous people, sick, living in harmony with nature, and think they have found a better way, except humans have not lived in harmony with nature in over 100,000 years, not even indigenous sick humans. In 1994, Tim Flannery an Australian zoologist and climate activist wrote The Future Eaters, an incredible book documenting the spread of humans across the earth and the mammals and birds they ate along the way, rather than paint a rosy picture of indigenous life, well, invader life, throughout history, he shows us for what we are consumers. Whether it's the megafauna of the northern hemisphere or the great birds of the south, humans ate everything they could easily get their hands on, resulting in human population booms, species extinctions, and vast environmental degradation. If that sounds familiar, it is because humans have not changed. To counter the UN's belief, let's look at three ways the globe's indigenous cultures change the planet. Large animal extinctions, deforestation, and population. And then we have a short quote from Ronald Wright, A Short History of Progress, Quote, a bad smell of extinction follows Homo sapiens around the world, close quote. Here in New Zealand, present-day Maori remember a time in their own generation as children when breakfast meant walking to the sea, plucking a flounder from the water, and bringing it home to the family. Now, 
the Huaraki Gulf is a virtual dead zone. Not only is that way of life gone for the Maori, it is gone for all five million New Zealanders. The same is true for would-be hunters and gatherers around the world. Europe is almost completely devoid of large mammals. North America's wildlife, which supported generations of indigenous peoples, are now gone. <clears throat> Even in states like Wyoming, where deer populations once outnumbered humans, deer would not last one month after grid failure. And I just have to point out, I don't think this man realizes that deer are not Native Americans. They, like humans, are invaders. And the other thing is that he, I wish he would pursue about this comment about deer would not last one month after grid failure. This is kind of a nod to the Bill Gady, G-A-E-D-E, -E, Bill Gady, uh, his theory of the sixth mass extinction. I've interviewed Bill, I believe, twice on this channel. You can find my interviews with Bill Gady uh, talking about after the collapse of global industrial civilization, you know, when the supermarket shelves are empty, the sixth mass extinction is going to be caused by humans eating, literally eating, every one of our fellow earthlings you know, when you can't go down uh, to the supermarket and buy one of your dead fellow earthlings to eat. They're going in the stew pot. But we're going to get back to this fine essay. <clears throat> Human population growth sounds the death knell of other creatures. There were only 250,000 Maori in New Zealand pre-European times, there are five million Kiwis, that's New Zealanders, not the bird, uh, there are five million Kiwis today. The only reason Maori plucked fish from the sea was because the fish outnumbered them and because they, meaning the Maori, had killed off the Moa. When the Maori arrived in New Zealand about 800 years ago, they discovered a large flightless bird similar to the ostrich, but gigantic, three meters, pretty much 10 feet tall. It is believed that lacking any predators on the island, the Moa did not flee from humans. Hunting them was as simple as walking up and clubbing them to death, providing roughly the same amount of meat as a whole cow. Uh, this is Flan from uh, Flannery's book, quote, The Moa became extinct within 300 to 400 years of the arrival of the Maori. One of the most extraordinary sites was discovered among sand dunes at Kalpakanui, in the Taranaki district of the North Island. There, the remains of at least three species of moa, along with 55 other species of bird, many of them now extinct, have been found in and around ovens. <clears throat> that also meant food was wasted. Typically, about a third of the meat available and moa carcasses was never used, close quote. Interesting how closely this number correlates to food wastage today. Uh, the, this abundance of easy food meant a concurrent rise in population. Flannery already estimates a 1% rise in population per year would result in tens of 
thousands of humans on the island within 400 years of settlement, abundant food was a form of wealth. It allowed dense aggregations of humans. Large villages sprang up around killing and cooking sites. After extinction, those sites disappeared and humans dispersed across the island. Are those the food patterns the UN wants us to emulate? Because we're already doing that. And then he goes back with another quote from the UN. Quote, through generations of close interactions with the environment, indigenous peoples sick, safeguard, safeguard an estimated 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity, close quote. So now we're going to look at indigenous peoples sick and deforestation. Archaeology is filled with examples of mass slaughter and extinction following human migrations. A thousand mammoths dead at one site, 100,000 horses at another. No sooner do humans arrive than large animals go missing. Mammoths and woolly rhinos the giant wombat, a tortoise as large as a car, giant bison, the giant sloth, he left out the giant lemur in Madagascar, not to mention our own hominid cousins, the Neanderthal and Den Denisovans. Then there are the trees. It is estimated some 30% of New Zealand's trees had already been felled before Europeans arrived to finish off the task. Maori used fire to clear land for easy traverse. They used fire to select certain trees over others for the use of pollen. They burned wood for fuel. This is not unique to New Zealand. Slash and burn agriculture is a global phenomenon practiced since the Neolithic. Indigenous sick populations have been practicing it in Mexico and Central America for thousands of years. 52% of the world's timber is still burned as fuel, mostly for cooking. This does not exclude rainforest. In Australia, rainforests were nearly exterminated by fire, well, exterminated by humans using fire before the first Europeans arrived. The Aborigines burned them to create open forests with little underbrush and copious grasses, attracting kangaroos and making them easier to hunt. In the summer, women and children then burned the grass to flush out rodents and, bur and birds on which they fed. In a sense, they lived in harmony with nature. Uh, the burning of rainforest provided a, fa a favorable environment for their food sources. Those same grasslands, you know, that were created by the Aborigines serve modern cattle as well, so we are still in harmony I don't believe this is what the UN had in mind. Here is a quote from uh, biologist Alfred Russell Wallace in 1876. A quote, we live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest and fiercest and strangest forms have recently disappeared, and it is, no doubt, 
a much better world for us now that they have gone, close quote. So now we're going to talk about indigenous people sick, poverty, and death. The sad truth is the planet we live on today is not the, implant, the planet indigenous people indigenous peoples enjoyed for 25 million years. I, I, I like this guy's subtle sense of humor. Equally true, the social, medical, and technological advances we have today were not enjoyed by those indigenous peoples. We cannot pick and choose. This is what the UN gets wrong about indigenous peoples sick. To look at them today is to see a people living in balance with nature. But that's only half the story. There are, in fact, two reasons this delicate balance exists. One, the nature they live with is what is left after humans entered the ecosystem. When the balance upsets, humans die off until balance is restored. And number two, the indigenous people sick are too poor to exploit the wealth around them. If they could, they would. <clears throat> I would highly suggest uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel for anybody who does not understand this uh, no shit Sherlock statement. The noble savages are too poor to exploit the wealth around them. If they could, they would. A UN report states, quote, one region, one reason indigenous sick and tribal peoples tend to use less machinery and agrochemicals is because they have less access to capital, close quote. That's not stewardship, that is poverty. Should they gain access to capital, they will pursue the same growth all humans have since the beginning of time. And they have in Peru, Bolivia, and Panama, indigenous peoples signed over nine and a half million hectares. That's uh, close to 30 million acres of forests in a scam promising jobs and local development. This is a Mustas uh, indigenous delegate from Peru. Quote, I did not quite understand the contract. None of us really did, but they talked about creating employment and international organizations. So that gave me her, uh, that gave me her, uh, that gave me head, that gave me her, uh, oh, close quote. That should not give the UN, uh, uh, that should not give the UN, uh, 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 give the UN, uh, uh, give the UN, uh, oh. Indigenous peoples sick have succeeded in living in harmony with their environment in one key way, dying young. They have a much lower life expectancy than adventitious peoples. Never heard the word adventitious in my entire life. In Australia, it's eight years less. In Canada, 19 years. In Asia, where 70% of remaining indigenous peoples live, 
There is no such thing as an indigenous person in Asia. <clears throat> Life expectancy is on average 20 years less than, you, you know, the second wave of invaders. Critics may say that's because of land encroachment, poverty, and, of course, colonial oppression, but that's not reassuring. Land is the one thing we're not getting more of. Poverty bodes poorly for the development of medical care. Colonial oppression only proves the one environmental factor indigenous people seem to balance poorly, the presence of other humans. Low life expectancy and poverty is not a model I am keen to follow. So, what is the path forward? It is more productive to recognize that humans have always impacted the environment. We did it 10,000 years ago when we started agriculture. We did it 60,000 years ago when we gathered, hunted, and burned. No human culture is immune to this. We cannot cherry pick one or another indigenous method as somehow contributing to climate change solution when others in that same tradi tradition contributed to climate change itself. It's a pretty cheap trick to ask indigenous people to steward after we fail to. We cannot emulate poverty and death rates to save ourselves from climate change. We cannot ask others to die poor to protect our forest. We can neither learn from low density cultures, nor can we abrogate our responsibility to clean up our mess. Stop looking toward indigenous people or indigenous voices. Stop looking in the past to find the future, or you may find our future has already been eaten, <laughs> which is exactly what it has been. Our future has already been eaten. And uh, it, it started uh, the day, uh, hell, I would say that the first human climbed down from the trees in equatorial Africa. But anyway, uh, I've already forgotten this fellow's name. Uh-oh. One more time, Ronan Cray. Oh, Ronan Cray moved away from New York City to live in New Zealand. Author of horror novels Red Sand and Dust Eaters, he finds nonfiction more terrifying. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ronan Cray from New York City, baby. Uh, a honky from New York City with the single best take down uh, of the myth of the noble savage I have uh, ever found. That was from medium.com, if I did not mention that. Anyway, now that we've uh, exploded the myth of the noble savage, I need to uh, get out my uh, go join my my noble savage trump tard friends and play some acoustic music while we still can. I uh, don't know if we have any songs about noble savages on our set list. I don't know if we do Running Bear and Little White Dove or not. 
anyway. Get out there and enjoy everything indigenous while you still can. Bye, guys.